Hello, I'm your host, Brian Callanan. How is Seattle handling a record heat wave? Where are new funds for COVID relief heading in our community? And what's the city council's new approach on regulating how police use less lethal weapons for crowd control at demonstrations or rallies? Council Public Safety Chair Lisa Herbold joins me to answer these questions and the ones you're sending in too, next on Council Edition. We don't want the eviction moratorium to be lifted before people have a chance to receive funding to help them pay their rent. All that and more coming up next on City Inside Out, Council Edition. And we are joined this month by Councilmember Lisa Herbold from District 1. Councilmember, thank you very much for joining us here. I wanted to talk about an important issue that's been breaking down over the last couple of days here as we're taping this show here. Some record high temperatures for Seattle. The super hot weather can be dangerous for a lot of people, and the situation gets even more troubling when you consider how early we are in the summer season here. I want to have you tell us what you've been doing to help people in your district, citywide too, and some thoughts on how to prepare for later this summer. Sure. The city has been working really hard on um, addressing the impacts of this um, incredibly uh, concerning uh, heat wave, record breaking heat between um, opening up cooling centers, fixing, um, uh, fixing water fountains, delivering water. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've been really focused on is the dry, hot conditions and how they contribute to fire risk. Mm. Um, we know that the Seattle Fire Department has been out there working hard um, on fighting fires. Uh, on Sunday alone, they responded to six brush and bark fires. Mm. And I just really want to take this opportunity as uh, we co are coming up on um, Independence Day, mm. July 4th, that the use of fireworks in these conditions is extremely dangerous. Um, they are um, not only fire risks, but they, their, their use can be deadly. Uh, you may remember two years ago in White Center, just south mm. of West Seattle, there was right. a, a burning house um, a death from smoke inhalation and the displacement of 12 residents from a neighboring home and that all resulted from the use of fireworks. So please don't light fireworks. Um, also dispose of smoking materials in proper receptacles and douse in water. Make sure that change or other car parts are not dragging from your vehicle and do not park on tall grass. All right, a lot to consider here this summer. Thank you for, for breaking that this, this part of it down. We're also recording this show just as the expiration of the eviction moratorium has been moved again from June 30th to September 30th here in the city and statewide. You worked with council members Morales and Lewis back in May on some legislation to protect nonprofits and small businesses that are behind on rent, but I wanna talk about this. Is this help from the council going to be enough when the rent comes due in September? Because in listening to the governor on this, it sounds like he's really trying to send a message that this is the last last extension of the moratorium? Yeah, I think um, it's an unanswered question about whether or not the resources that we're making available for rent assistance is, is sufficient. And one of the reasons why we don't know is because there are so many applications that have come in that have not yet been processed. And that's really the reason why we've, um, at the city level, as well as at the state level, um, have in, uh, expanded the uh, the eviction moratorium because we don't want the eviction moratorium to be lifted before people have a chance to receive funding to help them pay their rent, um, before landlords have a chance to see that funding um, as well. So um, it's uh, been uh, very uh, Frustrating to me as a policymaker, uh, given that we have allocated uh, significant funds, um, we're by the by the end of the year. I think we're anticipating that we will have allocated about fifty million dollars towards rent assistance, mm -hmm. both for small and large landlords. Mm -hmm. um, and we really need to see those dollars get out the door in order for us to do um, a good assessment of what the remaining need is. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and let me follow up on that question with regard to landlords especially. There are some housing providers who are saying the continued extension of the moratorium and the work by the Council on Renter Protection Laws are causing serious damage to the Seattle housing market. I got an email from one landlord on this. Corey writes this. Rental housing providers are selling their homes and we are losing supply. It's a huge problem and it's largely driven by legislative decisions about rental housing. Thank you for that email. And I want to talk to you about this, Council Member, because I know you've spoken in recent meetings here about helping smaller landlords, especially here, some who haven't received rental payments for 16 months and counting. What is your message to landlords right now? Yeah, I mean, it's really important, I think, for the city to recognize the needs of small landlords. And that's why, um, again, we have set up a separate pool of funds for small landlords uh, as far as the city allocation um, eight million of uh, of the dollars that we have previously allocated um, is specifically for for tenants and small landlords seven million to assist larger landlords the county also has separate pools of funds for small and large large landlords. They have allocated uh, about 22 and a half million uh, for tenants and small landlords and 75 million for, for large landlords. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I have found out just from talking to um, constituents who happen to be landlords is that there is on, on occasion, there's a situation where a tenant isn't um, availing themselves of the resources, uh, the rent assistance resources, they're not applying for assistance. And that's why I worked really hard um, with the Office of Housing and the United Way to set up um, a separate portal for landlords to access. So landlords themselves can apply for assistance. They don't have to and on a tenant applying for the assistance. And then the United Way will serve as sort of the interface be between the landlord and the, and the program to make sure that any information that is needed from the tenant is able to be attained. Yeah, that sounds like some good news for landlords. Just a quick question on this. I know the city of Seattle is trying to move out some of this funding, the county is too. Why is it taking so long for this to happen? You know, um, again, I I am <laughs> I uh, am, am frustrated that it is taking so long. Um, it is uh, being allocated through other programs. I know um, last year we were able to get out um, a, a significant uh, sum of dollars in that first tranche. Mm -hmm. It is being allocated through other programs um, funded by the state, by the by the county. Mm -hmm. And, and by the city, uh, and I, I know that we are intending to um, get these dollars out the door. I really don't have a lot of good information about why it's taking so long, though. Yeah, I know this has been a challenge for a lot of people, but thank you for taking on that question. I want to move on to the council's recent approval of the first half of the American Rescue Plan Act funding, or ARPA, the city calling this the Seattle Rescue Plan. I want to talk about this generally before we dive into the specific details of your work with arts and culture organizations. Uh, with this first wave of funding, about $128 million. You, the council, the mayor have talked about building back better. I want to try to figure out what that really means. How are we truly going to see a better city, more equitable city grow out of the pandemic? Sure. So, I mean, again, this is once in a lifetime funding. Um, it's intended to invest in the city and the um, existing inequities in our economy that have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, as you say, the, the mayor and the council um, uh, echo the call of President Biden to work to build back better. Um, and that's exactly what that means, is it's recognizing that we have uh, structural inequities in our economy that have been with us for a long time. And in order to build back better, we need to make sure that we're targeting these resources um, to those structural inequities. And so for what that means for Seattle Rescue Plan means funding to address housing and homelessness needs, funding for community and small business recovery, um, including downtown, funding for community well-being, um, such as um, direct cash, cash assistance to particular groups of workers that have been suffering. Um, one of the one of the community well-being items that um, I um, 
allocated or advocated, I should say, to mm -hmm. be included in that in the package as as proposed was uh, two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars for diaper distribution for organizations right. like our own West Side Baby. Mm -hmm. Diaper need is really closely linked to depression in new moms more so than even hunger. Mm -hmm. And diapers cost eighty to one hundred dollars a month. Sixteen percent of Seattle families struggle to afford diapers and and there's been an 86% increase in the number of diapers that um, were distributed to children and families during the pandemic. So, um, you know, in the community well-being uh, bucket, it's mm -hmm. recognizing um, what what is referred to as sort of the shadow pandemic, some yeah. of the behavioral, emotional, and mental health needs um, that are associated with the pandemic, whether or not it's an increase in suicide, um, increase in domestic violence in the home, um, and increase in 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 uh community um safety needs just just generally in our city yeah thank you for breaking that down on the large and district level too but i want to focus on some of the funding that you've secured for the arts and culture sector in seattle so this part of our economy as you know has been absolutely demolished by the pandemic and is likely going to take a lot longer to rebuild so you worked on some legislation to create grants for arts and cultural organizations, and also some direct financial assistance for individual artists and creative workers. What impact are you hoping to see from this? I know arts and culture make up a bigger part of our economy than a lot of people might realize. That's right. Yeah, that is absolutely true. Um, the um, uh, creative economy study found that in Seattle, um, the creative sector drives a full 18% of our city's uh, gross domestic product, and that's mm -hmm. four times the national average. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're talking about um, helping our economy uh, revive in the wake of the pandemic, if you're going to do that, you have to have the creative economy at the table. Mm -hmm. And in the pa in in past COVID relief um, packages, we mm -hmm. have uh, considered um, art organizations, cultural organizations to be to be small businesses um, mm -hmm. eligible for funding. But what we mm -hmm. found is that they weren't they weren't accessing the funding because it was going through the Office of Economic Development. And mm -hmm. what we really need is we need the Seattle Arts Office who works with um, these small arts organizations mm -hmm. to really take the lead on getting funds for small um, arts and cultural organizations out the door using the the grant program that they have for, for some of those those groups. The other piece um, that I that I worked on on this is related to a direct assistance to artists, right. recognizing that artists themselves um, mm -hmm. are the types of workers that that um, are again suffering uh, mm -hmm. in this in this pandemic, and um, we really need to look at ways to support them. And so um, the amendment uh, included in this package expresses the council's intent to provide funding uh, to um, to to for direct relief to, to artists. And just a couple a uh, couple other interesting I think facts uh, okay. about the arts community. Um, Washington State. Employment security data shows that the arts sector had the highest job loss of any sector mm -hmm. in King County at 55%. Yeah. And the Census Bureau reports that this sector is likely to take longer than most other sectors to recover. Mm -hmm. More than a third of arts and cultural workers have gone hungry at some point during the pandemic, according mm -hmm. to the American America for the Arts Survey. Yeah. And 80% of income claiming musicians sold an instrument to make ends meet. Right, a lot going on there. A $25 million fund set up for those individual artists. Make sure you check with the Office of Arts and Culture folks if you're interested in that piece of this because it's an important part of the economic recovery. But I wanna to touch on one more note of COVID relief before we move on to another topic. The council is now considering ending the $4 an hour hazard pay boost for grocery workers sometime later on this summer. I know you've heard from a few stakeholders on this issue in the council's committee on labor. Just some thoughts about this. Is now the time to consider ending this pay boost? Do you think this program was successful? Some thoughts about this, please. Yeah, we um, heard a panel presentation from um, from from workers and from the representatives of the grocery industry mm -hmm. in Councilmember Mosqueda's uh, committee last week. Mm -hmm. We know grocery workers have been essential workers since day one of the pandemic, when offices around the country and the world began closing up. Mm -hmm. Grocery store workers often 
paid minimum wage continue to go into work. Yeah. They put themselves and their, their families at risk so others can buy groceries. Mm -hmm. you know, we enacted hazard pay legislation because um, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, grocery chains initiated uh, additional compensation for their workers, what they called uh, hero pay. Yeah. But that ended by July of 2020, despite mm -hmm. the fact that these same chains were seeing massive profits while yeah. owners continue to put themselves and their families at work at yeah. risk. So, um, you know, this is, uh, I think, an, an evolving question. Yeah. I think it's important that we continue to listen to the CDC and our local he health experts so we mm -hmm. know how we should begin lifting restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, I am just now um, in the sort of beginning stages of, of learning about um, this proposal to uh, lift the $4 hazard pay. Got it, got it. Time of transition now, to be sure. I, I want to transition, if I could, to another issue in the show here. It's been a big part of your role as chair of the Public Safety Committee for the past 12 months, the council's ban on less lethal weapons used by police. So when the council passed these measures in June of last year, banning blast balls, stun grenades, tear gas, etc., it led to some pushback from the Department of Justice and the federal monitor overseeing the consent decree process the, that the SPD has been under for nearly a decade here. Those concerns, as I understand it, include this kind of a ban could lead to police using higher levels of force in crowd control situations. And also putting a ban like this in place without training could create some big problems. So I want to fast forward to where we are now. You've received some input from the DOJ and the federal monitor. Have you been able to answer those concerns? And will the council be able to pass a less lethal weapons ban this summer? Yeah, thank you, Brian, and thank you for putting um, the work that I'm doing now in, into this this sort of larger context. That's true. Back in June of last year, um, the council unanimously passed uh, um, legislation that um, severely restricted the use of less lethal tools. Um, I included language in that bill that uh, recognized the role of the consent decree and said that. Um, I, that the council expected that the court would review the bill um, mm -hmm. and that we would hear from our um, accountability partners at the Office of Professional Accountability, yeah. sorry, the Office of Police Accountability, the um, Community Police Commission, and the Office of the Inspector General. Mm -hmm. um, and so the court placed a, um, a basically a restraining order on the implementation of that right. of that bill. And so we went back to the drawing board, um, developed new legislation um, that has um, uh, been built on sort of the um, the the original bill. Um, mm -hmm. We sort of showed showed the original bill to the, the uh, accountability stakeholders mm -hmm. and said, what are the things in this bill that you um, agree on? What things do you think should be changed? Mm -hmm. And we started with the areas of consensus among the three accountability bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and we also um, sought the informal feedback from the Department of Justice and the monitor mm -hmm. and have had a, a number of, um, of meetings in, in the committee. We had two briefings with mm -hmm. the three accountability bodies and mm -hmm. a second one with the Seattle Police Department. Yep. Um, the consensus recommendations of the three accountability bodies, again, form the basis of the first draft. In February, um, we voted to send a new draft mm -hmm. <laughs> of the bill that has not been introduced yet to the monitor in the right. DOJ for their review. And so what the version that we talked about in committee last week was the version that does uh, take into just make some changes um, yeah. that um, uh, is uh, reflective of, of, of what we heard from the Department of Justice um, and and the monitor it um, so just uh, back of the envelope mm -hmm. uh, picture of what the legislation includes yeah. it does include a full ban on acoustic weapons mm -hmm. directed energy weapons right. glass balls ultrasonic cannons and water cannons, mm -hmm. and then use of um, what are called flashbangs, noise yeah. flash devices are banned in demonstrations, but it's not a full ban in all instances. Mm -hmm. And then the bill conditions the use of pepper spray and pepper ball launchers yeah. uh, on in, in instances where the risk of bodily injury from violent actions outweighs mm -hmm. the risk of harm to bystanders. Right. And then tear gas is only allowed in a very 
few circumstances. And so um, those are those are some significant changes. Um, key updates in response to the feedback from the DOJ and the monitor include um, adding a definition of crowd control. And um, this addresses one of the issues that you raised in the beginning, yeah. allowing the police department 60 days training after the court approves the legislation right. as required by the consent decree allowing allowing for that training on those uh, on these on these new requirements before yeah. they go into effect yeah a lot still ahead with this process thanks for breaking all that down yeah, i wanted I to talk about oh sorry, sorry if you would yeah yeah um just because there's been a lot of um confusion about what the next steps are mm, i'd like thanks. to just thank you i really appreciate it um there's been some uh, inaccurate reporting. So I just want to take every opportunity I have to sure. say what happens next. So if the council passes the bill, um, SPD then would have to draft policy revisions within 60 days mm -hmm. of its passage. Secondly, the D Department of Justice and the monitor would review the policy revisions. This is when their formal review under the consent decree takes place. Yeah. Um, they're not going to be reviewing the ordinance itself. They're going to be interview, uh, reviewing the policy that comes out of the ordinance. Mm -hmm. Then um, the court reviews the policy revisions um, as, as proposed by the police department to, to reflect the changes in the, in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. And then the court decides whether or not it's going to approve the policy revisions. Then the revised policy and substantive provisions of the bill will take effect. All right. Thank you for that, because I know there's a lot of work still ahead with that, and I appreciate you bringing that up. I wanted to move on to another public safety topic, if I could. Law enforcement assisted diversion, LEAD, a program that works to get people who might be repeat offenders into treatment rather than incarceration. You recently worked to appropriate $3 million for LEAD getting into that program. It's been overwhelmed with referrals during the pandemic, and you've also worked to change this program a little bit, too, such that referrals don't just have to come from law enforcement officers. I have a viewer who wants to know how this new version of LEAD is going to work. The question is this, how can Seattleites get neutral reporting on public safety impacts outcomes as lead scales up given tight political relationships between public defenders, city council and academic evaluators? A question about accountability there. Uh, your thoughts on that and your expectations for the expansion of lead. Yeah, I mean, I think LEAD is like any program that the city funds. There are there, there are contracts associated um, with LEAD and um, expected outcomes and reporting on those contracts and, out, uh, and outcomes and mm -hmm. corrective action if um, outcomes aren't uh, aren't achieved. I um, in oh, I think it was 2019 um, sponsored legislation that requires HSD to use re results based contracting mm -hmm. um, in order to address concerns that folks have um, about um, transparency and, and outcomes and, and making sure that we are making our policy decisions on funding um, based on um, providers that, that use best practices to deliver the results that we expect. Yeah, yeah. And then in terms of LEAD itself, expanding it, what, what results do you hope to see out of this program? So, um, I, I mean, I think I think a great example is um, the use of lead um, here in West Seattle a few weeks ago. Um, there was uh, an outdoor um, encampment uh, on a on a sidewalk mm -hmm. um, in South Delridge, mm -hmm. um, and um, it had been there since uh, late February, mm -hmm. and the city had been using um, the uh, the Hope program, which was the yes is the replacement for the for the navigation team mm -hmm. and had been doing outreach and engagement with uh, the residents of the encampment. Um, but it wasn't until uh, we called lead in um, in, let's see, probably, I guess it was um, May yeah. that um, we quickly saw a turnaround within uh, within a week. Mm -hmm. We saw people beginning to leave the encampment and mm -hmm. and really that's because of the the how lead um, the diversion uh, program that uh, assists people in accessing uh, case management services 
uh, drug treatment services, basic needs, mm -hmm. how it works together with the Just Care program, which yeah. is a program that has hotel rooms for people right. to access. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, ideally, that's how that program uh, should work together yeah. with Just Cares. It's right. been working. It worked that way very well down on Third Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, we saw um, a, a, a wonderful celebration about the, um, the um, ending of an encampment downtown. Yeah. And we're hoping to pivot um, the partnership of Just Cares and Lead to um, to City Hall Park yeah. um, in in the upcoming weeks. Wow. Okay. I know there's a lot of work ahead with that one. I'm gonna try to, if I could, cover some other topics with you. Another public safety topic I know you've been working on: moving some of the jobs traditionally handled by police officers into different departments, like human services. Your committee recently heard a report about the Safe and Thriving Division of HSD. So victim advocates from the Seattle Police Department are getting transferred there. Also positions dealing with mental health are getting transferred into human services too. What does the transfer of these positions mean? What impact are you hoping to see here when it comes to public safety? Sure, I, you know, when I think about this question, I always have the um, voice of um, a particular police chief, um, mm -hmm. I may have actually quoted him um, on your show before, yeah. um, a Dallas police chief um, noted back in 2016, and I've heard other police chiefs say uh, similar things. I've heard our own Southwest Precinct Captain Grossman say something mm -hmm. similar. Yeah. Um, but the quote is basically every societal failure, we put it on the cops to solve. Not enough mental health funding, let the cop handle it. Not mm -hmm. enough drug addiction funding, let the cop handle it. Mm -hmm. Schools fail, give it to the cops. Yeah, That's just yeah. too much to ask. Policing was never meant to solve all of those problems. Yeah. And so um, for me, the framework is by, is by um, asking police officers to do less of what they are not trained to do allows them to focus more on their core law enforcement mission. Yeah. And so cities, um, uh, all over the United States have made police departments uh, responsible for more than law enforcement. Over the years, uh, local government has turned the job of a police officer into mm -hmm. one that is expected to fix a wide variety of problems from yeah. resolving community disputes to yeah. uh, addressing substance abuse disorders, mm -hmm. working in schools, de-escalating behavioral health crises, yeah. responding to complaints about outdoor encampments. Sure. Um, and so really it's this effort is, um, again, it's about um, identifying who is most um, trained and most able to address non-law enforcement actions right. and trying to divert 911 calls um, to those other alternative uh, responders. Right, and, and uh, thank you for breaking that down. I've got just about a minute left, but I wanted to make sure we gave people some updates on the West Seattle Bridge in your district there. Shut down since March of last year due to those fast moving cracks in the concrete. Here in June of 2021, the repair is moving right along. A good environmental review approval that happened last week or so. Also an $11.2 million grant from the feds to help with the rebuild. A lot of chatter about this. A few tweets here. One person writes, this is good, but way too late to get anything repaired quickly. Another says, we need this bridge up and running ASAP. Uh, Council Member Herbold, help us put this in perspective. How do these developments help move the project ahead? Could they move up the completion date, which is supposed to be June of 2022? You, in your uh, remarks, noted uh, that the just this month we received the National Environmental Policy Act mm -hmm. uh, approval. Um, and that's a perfect example. We only just received that that permit approval. That is not something um, that we can speed up. It's in the hands of uh, another uh, jurisdiction, but it's a really important step that we've that we've reached this this um, benchmark. And it, it, we we received the um, the uh, approval of this permit earlier than anticipated. Um, and 
you know, the city does a, a watch list on its capital projects and it identifies yeah. specifically permitting as mm -hmm. one of the risks associated with this project. And so right. the fact that we've cleared this risk really shows the benefit of collaborating with outside permitting agencies. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but it also shows that there's some things that we can we can collaborate with outside um, yeah. uh, um, agencies, mm -hmm. but we don't have 100 percent control over over what happens. And so. Right. People, people who are asking for the project to be del delivered more quickly, I understand. I, 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 I feel your frustration, um, but we are really moving as as quickly as we 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 can. And I'm so grateful that we chose the repair option instead mm -hmm. of the replace option. I hear you loud and clear on that one. Thank you very much, Councilmember Herbold, for joining us. Thanks everyone for joining us here on Council Edition. We'll see you next time.